All right. Um, I think Josh made the announcements there, and especially the, um, to Pastor Samaru. Happy birthday. And um, the anniversary service, our 35th anniversary. Uh, next month, we have a special speaker, and it's going to be a big day. All right. Well, today, we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments. And here we are on the Seventh Commandment. What does it say? Can we see that together, please? A bit more. With some. Okay, turn to the person next to you now and say, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to explore a subject today that we don't talk too much in church about. We really don't. We shy away from it. And even though we live in sort of a sex crazed world, we don't talk, we don't use that word in church, do we? Mm. Right? <clears throat> And I guess we're thinking that, well, the young ones, the teenagers, the children, somehow they're going to absorb by osmosis, so to speak, some kind of a mental osmotic process, our beliefs and the scriptural teachings on the subject of sex. I'm going to have to go very quickly this morning. Um, but I've got a handout in the, in our, on our website that you can always catch up there. Um, you know... In the church, some people even see the word sex and this topic as taboo, you know. And some Christians may even see it as dirty. So when we talk about sex, it's usually what's prohibited. What's prohibited? Seven, the seventh commandment puts it quite succinctly, quite clearly. You shall not commit adultery. Well, what shall you do? What's the purpose of sex? And, and there's, a, there's so much to cover here. So what is adultery? Adultery is any sexual relation that is outside a marriage, and we have to add a bit more to that, define that a bit more, marriage between a man and a woman. All right? Adultery is any sexual relationship that is outside a marriage between a man and a woman. There are seven different things I want to point out to you this morning. First of all, I said last week, or when we talked about murder the other week, um, God created man, he created woman, he created man in his likeness and image. But let's add a bit more to that. God created man, woman, and the sex. As usual, when we go to Genesis to see God's design. After God created man in his likeness and image, he saw that Adam was all alone. <coughs> and he said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good. That the man should be alone. I'm going to make a helper for him. Men need help. So for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep, the Bible says, to fall upon the man. While he slept, he took one of the ribs and, and, and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought, he brought her to the man. The woman was not made from the dust of the earth and that's why women look a bit more refined, you know. And um, then the man said, now look at this. The man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Immediately, Adam was transformed into a romantic person. <laughs> bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The first of all, the country and western love songs. I lost my girlfriend, I lost my car, and I lost my dog. <clears throat> and then he says, um, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. So not only was there romance, but there was also commitment. Right? Commitment. He's ready to commit to her. And it goes on, the Bible says, They shall become one flesh. Chapter 2, verse 25. I, I, I didn't put up all those verses. And the Bible says, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Next comes intimacy. So there is, you know, romance, there's commitment, and here there's intimacy. They were not, and they shall become one flesh. And this is repeated in Genesis 4 and 1. It says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. What does it mean? He knew his wife. Whenever that word know or knew is used in these contexts, it is a euphemism for sex, sexual intercourse. Let like Joseph and Mary, the Bible says in Matthew 1.25, but Joseph, he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. He knew her not. He was not intimate with her until Jesus was born. 
So if your son or your daughter comes, somebody say, I know this person. You gotta ask them what they really mean. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, God's word declares in Genesis 1:28, and God blessed them. So the union between a man and a woman is blessed. A lot of people today choose, you know, to marry, you know, go in front of a judge or just sign the documents and so on. But children of God, they like to come in the house of God before the altar and repeat their vows and so on because it's sacred. Isn't that so? Amen. Marriage is sacred. So we gather from all this that God made man, he made woman, he made their organs, he made their hormones, he made every sensation. He made our bodies to complement each other. There's no guilt, there's no shame in sexual intimacy between a man and his wife. Nothing to be guilty or shamed about. The guilt and shame reflects we are engaging in that which displeases God. And all the ecstasy that someone enjoys in that encounter between the man and his wife, guess where that came from? That came from God. God is the one who designed our bodies and our minds and so on to operate like that. That comes from not the devil. And that's not just animal instinct. That was given to you by God Almighty. Sex within marriage is built around romance, commitment, and intimacy. So what's the purpose of sex? In God's original design, we can find a threefold purpose. And we look through the scriptures, we find the purpose of sex is for intimacy, intimacy, for pleasure, and for procreation. Pleasure, intimacy, and procreation. God knows the power of the sexual encounter. So what does he do? He doesn't say go and just sleep with anyone you want. He puts boundaries around it. He says you shall not commit adultery. So, oh, that's Old Testament, Pastor Mike. Well, let's see. Jesus endorses the commandment, and not only that, he raises the bar yet again. As with, with murder, we said last week, he said, not just murder, he said, if you're angry. The Bible tells us in Luke 18, a ruler asked him, he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why are you calling me good? No one is good except God alone. He says, you know the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not what? Do not? The first one he mentioned, he said, do not commit adultery. And then he goes on, do not murder and so on and so forth. He mentioned, but the first one he started with was, do not commit adultery. And as we saw last week, he raised the bar. He says this, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. <clears throat> he says it's not just committing adultery, it's the lust in the heart. He raised the bar. Just like every other sin, adultery begins where? In the heart. It didn't just happen. It was pre-planned. You know, like Stephen Covey said this. He said, all things are created twice. Like Pastor Sam and, and when they were doing this building here, right? This is not a building that they came and they, and they, they, they reached here. But in his mind and, and the, the, the architect who drew for this building here, right? In their minds, they saw this. This is what they had in mind. And then they went ahead and they, everything is created twice. And it's the same thing with our sin, adultery. You think about it, you plan. And what about the rest of the New Testament? So we see in the Old Testament, we see Jesus. And here we are, not for the rest of the New Testament. Do the other, and you say, Pastor, why, why, why are you going to all of this? Because I think we have kind of lowered our standards in the church to the world. So what the world is saying, we say, okay, well, maybe it applies to some people, not everyone. <laughs> the New Testament repeatedly reinforces this standard. The subject of adultery and sexual immorality is often repeated in the New Testament letters. It, is so, it seems to be as if it's the epitome of man's sinful, sinfulness. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he had to address it. Now let's talk about Corinth. Corinth was... was Somewhat like Toronto, you had this 
highly um, uh, 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 commercial and successful uh, city, you know, lots of business going on. And there were lots of people groups, there was plurality of different religious beliefs and so on. And of course, we've got different religions going on, different people thinking, different groups, and lots of money floating around. Next thing, there's a morality going with it, right? And in fact, there was a phrase that was coined to Corinthianize. And to Corinthianize meant you're living a promiscuous lifestyle, an immoral lifestyle. And, and this can creep into the church. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, even among the people who do not know God. In the church, you, there's somebody in the church doing something that even the ungodly doesn't do. This man has his father's wife. He's sleeping with his stepmother. And he, you know what he told the church? I want you to excommunicate that brother. You do not call him a brother. You expel him from the church. I say, Pastor Matt, that is, how can you do that? That is so unloving. But you know, one of the reasons why we have church discipline, I didn't put this in my notes here, but there's a reason, there's a threefold reason, I cannot remember all of them right now, for discipline. One, is instructed in the Bible. It's there in the Bible. Secondly, you want to let the individual know that what you're doing is out of line with the word of God. So you may say, well, I didn't know. No one told me that this was wrong. So we tell you. Secondly, you're setting a standard for the other believers because sin is contagious. Amen. Human nature is such. If one person gets, along, gets, gets away with something, everyone is going to do it. And thirdly, guess what? The people in the world are looking. Oh, you... In the, that they tolerate that in the church. So that's the reason why you have discipline. So Paul says, expel that brother. And in 2 Corinthians, he had to encourage them to take him back in after he repented. And then we have some other New Testament verses, Ephesians 5 and 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among sins. He said it must not even be named among you. Ephesians 5 and 5, he says, you may be sure of this, that everyone, look at that now, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater. He's calling this idolatry, and truly sex has come to the point of idolatry. Do you know that? Has no inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and God. He says the person who is sexually immoral you know, um, or impure, that person has no place in the kingdom of God. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Colossians 3, 5, and 6 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. God is not turning a blind eye to the wickedness in the world. People think I may be getting, getting away with it. And there's no God. He doesn't look. Oh, yes, he's looking. He's looking. He's watching. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4. And this one, the earliest, if not the first book. This is the first letter of Paul in the New Testament. Maybe the second book or the first book written in the New Testament. He says this. The first um, chapter 4, verse 3, 4. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Starts off with that list again. All of this seems to start with that. Um, you have, each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. So for Christians who shack up, Christians who decide to get, okay, we're going to get into a common law relationship, um, or we're going to live home, Please note that God calls this idolatry. This is sin. Amen? Amen? And even the world may not think twice about it because everybody's doing it. It's not according to the word of God. Here's the thing with two young people trying to say, well, we're going to save on rent and so we're going to live together. <clears throat> the man and the woman, they look at it differently. In the mind of the man, in the mind of the woman, she's thinking, this is a step towards marriage. He's going to commit to me because we're getting closer. The guy is thinking, this is how I can delay commitment. I can delay it. After all, he's getting what he wants to get. You see that? So women be smart. 
Um, the book of Revelation, I mean, and it's not just in the New Testament letters. We go all the way into Revelation, chapter 21, verse 8. And this is what it says. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, last week, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and lies, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The sexually immoral. So the question is, why? It is so sweet, so pleasurable. We need to, why put a downer on, on this thing? Well, why such an emphasis? Well, God, why don't leave me alone? 1 Corinthians 6, 16 to 20. And these verses you just mark off in your Bibles. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute... And these are people who are in the church were doing that. Becomes one body with her. So you're becoming one body. As it is written, the two will become one flesh. The two will become one flesh. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So in a sense, when you're connecting sexually with someone, you're joining bodies and you're joining minds, hearts, spirits together. Flee, run away, keep your distance from sexual immorality. Every, look at this now, every other sin. Some of you might say, um, Pastor, all sin is the same sin. <clears throat> not at all. Read the Bible. They're not all the same. Sin is sin, no. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. I choose to steal. I choose to lie. I don't know. Commit. He says every other sin you're committing, it's outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. You're sinning against your body. Do you not know? He goes on. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is precious to God. It is the temple of God. And which you have from God. And he says, listen, you don't belong to yourself. You know, a lot of us, we, we think we're independent. Oh, leave me, let me live my life alone. Mom, leave me alone. Dad, leave me alone. Pastor, leave me alone. Elder, leave me alone. Don't, don't, you know, don't tell me anything. Because I can live my life how I want. You're a Christian. No, you're not your own. We belong to Jesus. <clears throat> he says, and you were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus, the life of Jesus. He says, so glorify God, not just when you come to church, you lift your hands and you sing and you worship God and you say, I'm glorifying God in my spirit and soul. He says, glorify God in your body. Take care of your body. Eat healthily, you know, and, and exercise and, and see the doctor and, and, you know, things like that. <clears throat> So three things there. One, your body is a temple of God. And, and even Proverbs says this. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He, do, he who does it destroys himself. That's from Proverbs. Sexual immorality is sinning against your body. And in adultery, you're joining with someone physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The other thing about adultery is it brings devastation. It brings devastation. This is taken from um, the Journal of the American Board of Family Practice, 2001, speaking about parental divorce and the well-being of children, a meta-analysis, and um, the American Psychological Association, two different articles. And this one, they said, one, adultery, I mean, usually they're using that word adultery, but this was back in the past. Now you're not gonna hear that word coming from the secular world. Adultery often causes lasting damage that no amount of repentance can undo. And it is extremely hurtful to the spouse. Extremely hurtful. It often leads to divorce and leaves the marriage partners embittered, disillusioned, and financially poor. It robs the children of the love and security of a healthy family and denies them a good role model for their own future marriages. Secondly, children from families where there is conflict and are divorced are more prone to anxiety, 
poor school performance, drug abuse, and delinquent behavior. These problems can exist into adulthood. Adult children of divorced parents tend to have lower education attainment, lower income, more children out of wedlock, higher rates of divorce themselves, and a lower sense of well-being. Other thing from a medical standpoint, we know that sex outside of marriage and premarital sex can lead to STDs, unwanted pregnancies, and then they end up doing an abortion, broken hearts, and low self-esteem. But then you say, but I can't control myself. What do I do? Well, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2 says this. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Paul says it's good for you not to. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. He says get married if you can't control yourself. Everybody's doing it. He says get married. And then he goes and he says in 1 Corinthians 7 and 9, for it is better. I think we have that one. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. I think the King Jim says just to burn. Some might say, me, me burn in hell. No, no, no. It's, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Let's look at something else here. My spouse is not interested. Let's talk about that. My spouse is not interested. How do we navigate that? Well, what if one person decides they will use it as a weapon to bring the other one in line? Bring my husband or my wife in line, you know? I'm going to withhold intimacy. Well, this is what the Bible says. You might say, are these things in the Bible? And the reason why I'm going into all these verses here is to show you that the scriptures cover all these things. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And likewise, the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That's clear, isn't it? He says, do not deprive one another. Do not deprive one well, vexed with you. I'm angry. You didn't do this. Or he didn't do that. And okay. Except perhaps. And this is what he says. Except perhaps by agreement. Oh, it's there. For a limited time. That you may devote yourself. And this is the reason. This is the reason given. That you may devote yourself to prayer. He says, but then Paul is saying, then come again. So that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Because of your lack of self-control. <clears throat> so there shouldn't be no manipulation in marriage using intimacy as a tool. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. <clears throat> Paul says, none of that. Husband, meet your wife's needs and vice versa. Wife does not have authority of her own, own body, nor does the husband. Know. Do not deprive one another and come together again. He says, you've been given a wonderful gift in marriage. Enjoy it. And what studies have shown that married couples actually enjoy intimacy more than the unmarried couples. Initially, two couples were just hooking up, yeah, for a while, but in the long run, no. And finally, so we talked a lot here about sex, um, adultery, and within marriage. And so we have to address also something called unlawful sexual relations sexual perversion so in leviticus 18 i'm actually getting through this material much faster than i thought <clears throat> we read a very specific list of sexual practices that god pronounces on and um, you, a lot has to do with incest and you may say leviticus master mike <laughs> That was written about 40, uh, I said, 3,400 years ago. So it's a long time. It doesn't apply to us, you know, these things. Um, well, when you're sitting across from someone, 
who's been abused sexually in the home and you see the heartbreak and you see how they're struggling with anxiety and depression for decades and decades and decades into their lives, then you begin to think back. That is how horrible sexual abuse is and incest is. And we live in a part of the world, and I guess it's all over the world you hear these things happening. Horror stories. Horror stories. Incest. In Leviticus 6 to 18, and I'm just going to summarize for you. You can read when you go. Leviticus 18, you can read it when you get home. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover their nakedness, meaning um, sexual um, intercourse. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, your sister, your granddaughter, your aunt, your daughter in law, your brother's wife, a woman, and her daughter. And then he goes on to talk not just about incest, but he talks about bestiality. Leviticus 18 and 20, she said, Pastor Mike, that is so, mm, that's horrible. Those things don't happen. Oh, yes, they do. My wife is making faces at me here. <laughs> Doesn't like these topics, but I've got to address these things. This is actually happening in the world. I didn't touch on pedophilia, but that's one of the most horrible. But if you haven't seen Sound of Freedom, make sure do go see Sound of Freedom. Because you see, child sex trafficking. Human trafficking is a $150 billion a year um, industry. Human trafficking. And then there's sex trafficking. And it's just growing. Just growing. Um, bestiality. You shall not lie with any animal, uh, make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. He says it's a perversion. I say, those things are, I have never heard of that. Yes, they happen. Had a patient once with that. And finally, homosexuality. <clears throat> In the subject matter of adultery and sexual immorality, I have to address the subject of homosexuality. We do not preach and teach on this subject. Um, and so what happens is that the moral landscape is defined by the world. And so the world has this concept that it's okay, and that's fed into the church. Don't you dare touch it. Don't talk about it. It's the Old Testament. And many Christians accept, and they would even defend homosexuality. So before I mention these verses, I have to declare that God loves the gay person. All right? Just as much as he loves every other person, and this congregation is open to anyone. However, we will not change our theology and the scriptures to suit anyone. Amen. I'll give you the word as it is, right? Amen. But we treat everyone with love and respect. Everyone. So they may hate us, but we still have to love them. Amen. So another reason why I have to touch on this topic is that because the church has not been teaching this for decades, Stand where the Word of God stands. We're in the position where we are right now that our children are being brainwashed in schools. Amen. They're not just being indoctrinated, they're being brainwashed in schools. And the schools are shutting down any kind of debate and any kind of um, reports or objections from parents to say, this is inappropriate for you to be teaching my child. The schools are shutting it down. The school boards are shutting it down. And so that is why it's even more important that we know what the Word of God says and we teach our children. And, and even attend the PTA meetings and, you know, when those things come up, begin to raise your voice. It says, Leviticus 18.22 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And no other word, uh, in no other place abomination is used for sexual practices except for homosexuality. So it's not just any kind of sin. It is abominable in the eyes of God. Homosexuality. Leviticus 20 and 13, he says, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. And uh, many people say, well, oh, you know, well, that's the, the Old Testament. But do you put two different pieces of clothing together, as they said? And, and do you plant this with that? And, and they're trying to, you know, make a joke out of it and say, well, those are the other Old Testament laws. 
you know, and slavery, and, and do we still do that today? So we, well, ignorance is a bad thing. <clears throat> the Old Testament laws, you can separate them into three. One, you've got the moral law, you've got the ceremonial law, which applied to Israel, and you've got civil law, applied to them as a nation. But <clears throat> forget that. What does the New Testament say? This is what it says. Um, <clears throat> Paul in 1 Timothy 1, he says this, The law was not laid down for the just, but for the sexually immoral. Do we have that? I'm sorry, I should put that up. One, 1 Timothy 1.10, Men who practice homosexuality. So it's quite clear. In Romans 1, we find no complementary words to describe same-sex relationships. This is what Paul said. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Look at the words used. Dishonorable, unnatural, shameless, and error. Those are the words used to describe homosexual behavior. And if <clears throat> this is not enough, Paul uses very specific language in the Greek. In the Greek text to denounce homosexuality along with other behaviors. And this is in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Now, in your English Bible, you're not going to see it. <clears throat> you would have to get a study Bible to pick this up. The ESV <clears throat> or the NIV. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. So that's one word. But in the Greek text, there are two words used. You will see in the footnotes of the study Bible, the word homosexual captures two Greek words, madokos and arsenokoitis. These refer to the passive and active partners in the homosexual act. So Paul is quite clear on this. And People say, well, I'm a gay Christian. That's an oxymoron. There's nothing such as a gay Christian. And so in conclusion, I'm just going to give you one verse of scripture. The Bible says, let marriage, let marriage be held in honor among all. Hebrews 13 and 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. I know what I've done today. I've not given you my opinions, my thoughts, and my beliefs. I've given you the scriptures, what it says. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll move on to the next one. Beloved, the world has their way of living. But let us be clear. Let us clearly understand what God's word says for the church of Jesus Christ. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And saints of God, righteousness, holiness, someone said it's still in style. And the Bible says without holiness, no man is going to see the Lord. He says, be holy as I am holy. Can we stand together, please?